All right. Looks like we got the comments set up uh, over here. We got the feed going and uh, all is right with the world, if you will. Okay. Uh, we're going to be talking about coffee today. Uh, it's an important thing. This is something I've uh, lectured over uh, many times in different classes. I'd have a beverage class where we'd cover coffee and teas and things like that. Uh, catering is another one where I'd slide in a little bit of coffee knowledge. Uh, and that one you need to know uh, coffee service for large amounts of people, right? And uh, small amounts alike, right? So uh, for this one, I'm going to go over some basics. We're going to talk about brewing techniques, of course, but we're also talking about different types of coffee. Uh, uh, we are talking about uh, um, uh, where the coffee comes from. We're talking about um, uh, uh, different grinds, different roasts, things like this. All of that background knowledge you need to know about coffee. And uh, then we're going to get into some brews. I'm actually going to do a little cup of espresso and uh, uh, and then we'll call it a day, okay? I'm hoping this will be kind of a quick, light, and fun episode. So here we go. Uh, to make it official, okay, I want to make sure that I welcome you all to another installment of Industry Cooking uh, Formally, okay? Um, I am Dave Nelson and I am your host. For the show, I am a grown man and I am doing a pretend cooking show in my home kitchen every Monday at 4 p.m. It's hardly sad at all. But today, uh, as I said, we're talking about the world's favorite wake up call coffee because let's face it, people only drink tea because they can't handle the main beans. Now, ever since I was an 18 year old illegal alien working in Germany, I appreciated a strong ass cup of brew. I mean, really strong. The American coffee of my youth just did not do it for me when I arrived back in the States. Um, I'm old enough to remember when America didn't really know what a cup of coffee truly was. People would buy army surplus coffee that had been roasted and ground during the Cold War. They packed it in a can and then uh, you know, my folks would put a tiny, tiny bit in a pot and then boiled it uh, uh, to ensure that the life-giving essences were completely lost to the heavens, okay? There seemed to be an effort to extract enough tannins out of the coffee and into your cup to make your mouth pucker up and twist itself up like a razor clam taking an ice bucket challenge, okay? Um, Say what you will about the big Seattle firm, uh, the big big coffee chain that nearly uh, uh, became a new American religion of perpetual caffeination. But uh, I, I don't want to mention any names, but I think we all know who we're talking about. Seattle, big, big coffee conglomerate, right? Uh, but they did bring this country along the path of wanting a decent cup of coffee. And I do appreciate that. Uh, let's give it up for them. Again, I don't want to mention their names. But in this one, I'm gonna break down the basics to brew your cup of morning rocket fuel, okay? Uh, as I said earlier, I'm gonna cover terminology, types of coffee, roasts, grinds. I'm talking about the brewing and also the holding, okay? And I'm also gonna do some really, really basic barista moves using my really, really bitch and shiny espresso machine that I love, okay? Um, so before I start class, people, I need to read off the morning announcements as I always do. Um, Again, I'm Dave Nelson. I'm a longtime chef and culinary teacher. I've been bringing my culinary school lectures to the people on the internet ever since the COVID shutdown began. Now, these fake shows that I do, they are live. They can be a little bit rough, okay? I'm just doing it, it's just me and my kitchen, okay? Um, and also, I can be a little bit of a smart ass at times, quite frankly, but the techniques and the kitchen wisdom that I'm laying down is pretty darn rock solid. Okay, you can think of this as a way to hack culinary school. Everything I'm laying down here is basically what I was being paid to lay down in culinary school when I was teaching career uh, career skills to people that wanted to go out into the industry. Okay, so basically you are hacking culinary school right here. As a companion piece to the live show that we do every single Monday, just like you're watching right now, I started a Facebook community. Um, it's called Industry Cooking Community. It is for chefs, teachers and home cooks. And it's there to kind of share ideas to use as a platform also to promote your food centered side jams. Okay. So check that out. If you haven't already, it's a lot of fun and there's uh, pretty cool people over there, much cooler than your humble host. Okay. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Also, if you'd like to check out the show archives, I've got tons of these things. Okay. Um, along, you know, I also have some exclusive content over there. Look into the industry cooking channel on YouTube. Okay. We've got wall to wall kitchen knowledge just laying around for you to pick up and plug straight into your frontal food lobe. Okay. Uh, finally, we always have our comment line open. If anyone like to, would like to add to the conversation by adding your questions or comments, 
thoughts and feelings, uh, or just shout out to um, share, okay? I'm going to ask that we try not to make the host cry this week, okay? It's always a much better show when I don't cry, and I'm just going to leave it at that, okay? That's the announcements. Let's get into some coffee now, okay? Um, basic stuff here. This is all intro stuff. I'm not going to get too, too deep into it. I am not uh, uh, one of those coffee sommeliers or anything like that, but uh, um, we're going to scratch the surface here, and I think you'll get some valuable information out of this, okay? Now, I think you're all old enough to know where the baby coffee beans come from. I think we can have this conversation, okay? So basically, we're going to take a look at the globe here, the planet. Let me kind of get the camera on there, okay? And we're going to be talking about a geographical band that follows the equator. You know, that's the middle of the globe, middle of the planet, right? But I've got a dotted line up here. You can just barely see it out there. And that one line is called the Tropic of Cap Cancer, I believe, right? Yeah, the, the northern one is the Tropic of Cancer. And then we have another dotted line down in the bottom here, down near the bottom. And that is the Tropic of Capricorn. And I'm still looking for it. It's right there, okay? So this band right here, is what was known as the tropics. And that is where we are talking, uh, where we are producing coffee throughout the world, okay? It's a pretty narrow band and you're not gonna get any coffee growing above or below those, those bands there, the tropics of Cancer or uh, uh, Capricorn, okay? Um, so this uh, line, it's about just a, be technical, okay? It's at 23.5 degrees latitude, okay? And it's, uh, uh, again, both north and south of the equator. It's kind of like the Earth's belly band going around, okay? Now, knowing this, I want you to shout out in the comments here, if anybody's there, um, can anybody tell me one type of coffee that the U.S. produces? There's only one coffee that is produced in the U.S. region. So go ahead and shout that out in the comments when you get that, and we'll shout that out, okay? Um, now, um, I want to kind of, kind of, I want to talk about two main types of coffee plants that grow in this area, okay? Uh, first of all, we're talking about uh, Caffea Robusta, okay? This is the, the, the family name for the plant, and uh, sometimes called also Caffea Canifora, okay? And also, we look at Caffea Arabica, and you've probably heard that Arabica term around, this is your higher quality beans, okay? Um, you, you, you probably think, you hear that term Caffea Robusta, and you're thinking, oh, it's a robust cup of coffee. That's what I want, right? But it's not really talking about how the coffee tastes or anything, but rather how, uh, uh, how hardy the plant is. The plant is robust. The beans are not so robust in the cup, okay? So um, uh, uh, they're typically used on those large coffee plantations, these Cafe Robusta plants. Um, these are the, the places that are doing the bulk coffee that you see in cans, you know, with like Folgers on it or MJB, Maxwell House. That's basically what we see when we're looking at those um, Cafe Robusta plants. Cafe Arabica beans, they are known as the bean for discerning coffee fans, okay? When I talk about coffee, Arabica beans are always, always going to be implied. I'm not going out looking for Robusta beans. I'm looking for Arabica beans. That's, that's what we're looking for. Those are the quality beans. Um, now, if we look at the globe, you can see many of the countries around the planet, let's, let's take a little look at that, many of the countries within the tropics there are... Um, very reminiscent of names of coffee, okay? If I go around the world here, you're gonna see things like, um, you know, in Africa, you see, see things like, uh, places like Ethiopia, Kenya, right there on the equator. I've actually been on the equator in Kenya, okay? Um, you kind of go around here, uh, the lower end of India here, right? Ceylon, um, uh, Micronesia, Indonesia, all through there. You're gonna have a lot of coffee types coming from that area as well going around the uh, uh, the world here. Oh, there it is right there. The US coffee and Ms. Ann got it out here as well. Kona coffee, that's the only American coffee. Sorry about the glare there, but it's right there. That's the only part of America that falls within the tropics, okay? And so that's where we see our, our American coffee there, if you will, or our US coffee. Uh, we get over actually to the Americas, as I should say, Central America, it's right in that, that um, uh, golden zone for coffee production, as well as the upper half, half of South America as well, right? And so your, your Colombia, your Nicaraguan coffees, you know, your Guatemala, all of that stuff is, is just prime coffee growing territory. All through Brazil, you probably heard the old song, 
uh, uh, weighed down among Brazilians, coffee beans grow by the millions, right? So you can see tons and tons of countries with names that correspond to the names of your favorite coffees, okay? Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Java is in that Micronesia, right? You hear about Java, that's one of the more expensive coffees. A lot of the coffees from that Micronesia area in around, you know, the, the Indian Ocean, all of that, uh, they tend to be pretty expensive. There's a lot of piracy over there, which kind of drives up the prices there. Uh, so uh, a lot of fluctuation in coffee prices. You might've even heard that prices are just gonna be going up as we um, coffee. Uh, I just heard a, uh, an article the other day saying that we are going to be outstripping uh, coffee supplies with demand here. So um, coffee is gonna be going through the roof here. So if you are buying coffee, you wanna know uh, how to get the best out of it, okay? Now, as you're looking at it, let me, let me kind of get back up here. I'll get rid of the globe. We get the idea, it's round. So as you are looking at coffees, um, you might see the names of varietals within the country as well um, as, as uh, uh, different, different plants might have mutated and things like that, created a unique style or flavor, uh, uh, or maybe they developed a, a disease resistance or drought resistance of those coffees, right? So you'll see other names that don't necessarily uh, have anything to do with a place, okay? So what I'm talking about there, we're, we'll, we'll see like um, coffee beans listed as bourbon beans, right? Or geisha, Mondo Novo, right? That's another uh, uh, a hybrid between two, uh, uh, two different plants, okay? Uh, and of course, everyone's favorite, the delicious S795, okay? You've got a bunch of coffee uh, uh, plants that just like a scientific formula basically right and so um other things that you might see in a coffee name are plantation names might be sprinkled into the lexicon of names that you see out there as well okay so um those are all kind of geographic or or specific to the plant that it's coming from okay there are other coffee names out there though that i want to kind of separate out that are a little bit different because um you know, we are looking at, at other coffees like French roast and things like that. Typically the varietals, when we buy those, they're very, very expensive. And when we purchase them, we're looking for certain flavor characteristics associated, associated with the varietal. But um, what about when we see those roasts, right? What about when we see like French roast or Italian roast just on the bag and it doesn't tell you where the bean came from or what it is, what you're seeing there is usually usually we'll see kind of a lesser bean, okay? Um, if I have a very light roast on a bean, and, and I should go through the roast real quick. Let's just run through them real quick and then I'll get back into it, okay? Um, the lightest roast typically is just barely, you know, gets from green and just into the color of brown. Coffee beans start as green. They get into the light brown and we call that a cinnamon roast, okay? And then you get into light roast. So yeah, if you're used to a light roast, there's an even lighter roast called cinnamon, okay? Uh, after the light or medium roast um, is sometimes called city roast as well. And then you'll have it a little bit darker. Every time we step up, it just gets a little bit darker and a little bit darker. We, we get up to the next level and you'll see full city roast that might be familiar with some people, okay? Uh, and then we start getting into the darker roasts. Uh, the first of the dark roasts would be called dark, okay? That one's an easy one to remember. But then you get into French roast, which is even darker. You start getting into these, the French roast, that's where you start seeing the beans getting really, really dark, but also very shiny on the outside. Um, uh, French roast beans are very, very shiny. And then you'll get into an even darker roast, and that is the Italian roast, okay? Now, when we get into these roasts, um, we aren't really looking for a high, high quality bean. If I'm, I get, if I spend the money on a high quality bean, I, and I take it to French roast darkness or Italian roast, I have just burnt up all of those qualities that I just paid for. Okay, so when I am buying the high quality bean, I'm not looking for a darker roast. The the I'm I'm the flavors that I'm looking for would be lost to the furnaces if I did that. Okay, uh, there's there's another thought here too, right? Um, flavored coffees, you see those out there. Usually when you are getting a flavored coffee, much like those dark roast coffees, they're gonna go ahead and use a lesser bean because they can kind of get away with that. Um, so we can buy a, a, a flavored coffee with, you know, let's say it's a little Bailey's Irish Cream flavored coffee beans, right? Oh, wow, that just sounds so good. Um, they've added Bailey's Irish Cream essence to a lesser coffee bean and sold it to you for a premium price. Oftentimes you are much, much better off buying a high quality bean and flavoring it yourself, you know, nothing wrong with putting a little shot of Bailey's Irish cream in if that's the flavor you're looking for, or a hazel, a, a hazelnut liqueur, or, or even the Tironi syrups that you see in all of the Starbucks and all of those other places. <clears throat> Let me get a little, uh, little sip here, as long as we're doing coffee. 
All right, so back into it. Uh, bottom line, getting back to those flavored coffees and also getting back to the uh, <clears throat> darker roast. You wanna spend your money on getting a good quality bean and then adding flavors of your own for the flavor. If you're buying a darker roast, you're not so worried about getting the, the most expensive bean on the planet because when you just do a dark roast, you're not gonna get the flavors of say a mocha java or something like that, right? Uh, so that's basically it on roasts. We just covered the, uh, the um, uh, flavored coffees as well. Uh, grinds, this is another thing to talk about. Now, typically when we are buying coffee, um, we are buying whole bean coffee, ideally. The minute I grind coffee, it is going to start losing some of those characteristics that we are paying so much money for, right? So um, if I have the whole bean, I grind it right before I use it and I am going to get the most out of those beans, okay? Um, now, when we look at different grinds, there are different coarsenesses. Coarsenesses, that's a word. It's totally a word, right? Um, there are different coarsenesses, courses, <laughs> coarseness of grinds. And the grind is typically tied to the type of coffee making equipment that you're gonna be using, okay? And so, Basically, we uh, we have kind of a gamut running from like coarse grind uh, that we'll use in something like a French press. And I'll show you a French press here in a little bit. But French press, if I have a, uh, if I have a French press and I use a really, really fine grind in there, the screen in the French press is not able to kind of filter out that really, really fine grind. And so I'm going to wind up with a really muddy cup of coffee. There's going to be a ton of sediment in there, right? So for a French press, also cold brew, we want a coarse grind, uh, again, so I don't wind up with a bunch of dust, coffee dust in the bottom of my cup, okay? Um, moving up, uh, when I am getting into, say, drip coffee makers, I want more of a medium course, okay? Still little tiny pebbles in there, but, you know, it's getting to kind of a medium medium grind or a, a, a medium look to it, okay? Uh, we get into medium grinds when we're using drip coffee makers. Uh, when I'm doing espresso, we're going to want a very, very fine grind for that, but there's an even finer grind. Uh, uh, and by the way, the fine grind is called fine, right? Hold on to your hats. And then we get into a very fine grind or extra fine uh, that we'll use for making uh, Turkish coffees and things like that, which is a whole thing unto itself. And I'll talk about that later as well, right? So when we're talking about grinds, we want to grind our own beans. And we also want to kind of grind specific to the coffee maker that we're going to be using. Coarser grinds for like a French press, medium grinds for your drip methods, like a, a Melita pour over kind of a thing or a drip machine. And then for espresso, we want very, very fine. Okay. And, and that's kind of the, that in a ballpark, uh, in the, in a, in a nutshell, that's what I mean to say. Now um, let's, uh, those are the grinds. Those are the roasts. I talked about flavored coffees. I talked about uh, origins of coffees, all of that. Uh, let's talk about how to brew, okay? There's something in the tea world called the golden ratio. It's the amount of tea you use for water to brew a pot of tea. And we also have a golden ratio for coffee as well, okay? Um, so it's it's a ratio. We go by ratios in the kitchen all the time. And this ratio usually runs about one to 15 parts. One part coffee to 15 parts of water, okay? 15 actually to 18, you can make it a little lighter, but I like a stronger pot of coffee, okay? So for you Americanos out there, okay, this is gonna break down to about a half ounce of coffee for an eight ounce cup, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, for eight ounces of water. So half ounce coffee for every eight ounces of water you use, and that makes a pretty darn good cup of coffee, okay? So that is kind of how much you wanna use. The next thing to talk about is, I like to pre-warm equipment like carafes, some of my cups and everything ahead of time, especially if you're making coffee that, that goes into a thermos and the thermos is gonna hold it. I like to have my coffee cup warm. I like to pre-warm that thermos before the coffee starts running into it, okay? And so uh, that's a good idea. Um, if you have ever seen an espresso machine and they have all the coffee cups and saucers up on top of that, that machine is actually warming those coffee cups. There's a reason why they do that, okay? And so uh, that's a thing that we do. And when I'm in a fine restaurant and I'm paying top dollar for a meal, I'm getting coffee at the end and they deliver those coffee cups and then they come out with a coffee pitcher to pour off the coffee, before they come with that pitcher, I'll reach over and I'll kind of touch the back of that cup, you know, and, and just see, oh, do they warm their cups here? Because if they do, this place has got it going on a little bit and as far as coffee service goes, right? So pre-warmed equipment is a plus, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, let's talk about the water. 
for our brewing, okay? Now, when we're doing water for anything in the kitchen, I've said it multiple times, we never, never wanna use the water out of the hot water tap, okay? That water's been sitting in a nasty old hot water heater. It might even be rusty. There's definitely mineral deposits in there. It's got a metallic taste to it. Um, I always, always recommend using cold tap water, even let the water runs a little bit, okay? I know we're in a drought, but let the water run for a little bit and get that really, really fresh tasting effervescent water that still has a little life to it. I know it sounds funny, but it's a thing, right? Um, when we are doing, uh, uh, when we're bringing the water up to temperature, okay, we don't want to boil it. Most coffee makers do not bring your water up to 212. The ideal temperature lies between about 195 to 205, okay? In the kitchen, this is what we call a near boil. And if you're just making water in your pot or, or bringing water up to temperature in a pot for the coffee that you're going to make, um, you're looking for those little tiny bubbles to start forming inside your pot. Your pot of water is gonna look like a glass of Sprite. You know what I'm talking about? All those little teeny bubbles are just stuck to the pot. Occasionally they're rising up, but we're not at that boil where we've got that surface agitation going on, okay? So do not boil the water. You'll just boil the life force from it, okay? Uh, uh, next step is one that you might not be familiar with unless you've been a barista or been into the coffee world, okay? The next step, once I get my water, um, uh, uh, my water up to temperature, my grounds are, are ground and they're ready to go and they're measured out for it. I want to bloom the grounds, okay? This is a process that takes about one minute. And if you're doing kind of one of those pour over methods, you're just gonna go in there and just wet those grounds with the hot water. And you're gonna kind of release some gases out of there and everything, but you're also going to start the process of extracting those oils and oils are flavor, right? We always say fat is flavor in the kitchen. Oils carry flavor. They are a vehicle for flavor. And so we bloom that and the oils start releasing from the grounds. They're going to be extracted much more efficiently if you give this blooming thing a little chance, right? So um, you bloom the grounds, get it hot, hot water on there one minute, and then you can go ahead and go to town with the water, okay? So you're gonna start pouring the water in. And uh, this is kind of taking me back because when I was a, a young man, a bachelor, I was always doing the pour over method for my coffee, right? And so um, I would go ahead and fill up the, the cone. I'm using a Molita cone basically. And uh, I, I fill up the cone and just let it flow through, fill it up again maybe and let it flow through. And then I immediately get the grounds out of the, out of the way, okay? I don't want old coffee grounds sitting above my pot that I'm keeping my beautiful coffee in. Okay. Um, those coffees are, are, will, are filled with tannins, basically. Once I extract the good stuff, if it continues to kind of uh, extract, I'm going to start getting these tannins, and they are going to produce a very, very bitter coffee. Earlier, I said it's like it's just going to pucker your mouth up, basically. It's just not pleasant, okay? We, we don't want tannins. We just want the essence of coffee, okay? So um, once your coffee is done brewing, get rid of those grounds. Don't leave them sitting above the, uh, the pot at all, right? They're just going to make it worse over time. As far as holding the coffee, once it's, once it's kind of done its thing, a thermos is best, and you see the big company that I talk about, right? Uh, I'll just say it. You see Starbucks, right? They use a thermos. They even put a timer on there, and it usually uh, set for about 20 minutes, I think they, they use. Okay, that was usually kind of my thing. Um, and uh, that timer is just going to kind of let you know, hey, we're getting to the end of the life cycle of this, and it's going to start getting bitter. That coffee sits for a while, and again, you're going to kind of develop tannins after a while. Okay, so uh, um, thermos is best, right? Sitting on a burner like the old Mr. Coffee's, right? It would go into a glass carafe, and it's sitting on this burner. Um, that burner is going to speed up that degradation degradation, if you will, right? You're going to lose flavor from, from heat labelization. You know, everything you smell is actually flavor coming out of that pot, right? So you're going to lose flavor and you're also going to develop more bitter tannins. So the, the burners aren't such a great thing. We see those in restaurants a lot, restaurant service. If you've ever worked a business, uh, uh, that's what we got, right? Uh, so we want to kind of, kind of set a time limit on that of, of how long that coffee sits around and uh, once it's kind of reached that limit, you might want to kind of double check it, make sure it's either still good or maybe uh, uh, just give it uh, the heave ho and start with a fresh pot, okay? At this point, um, that's kind of the, the holding. We talked about the water. We talked about the, uh, you know, the, the golden ratio in that section right there. Now I want to kind of talk about some different 
methods of making coffee. And the first one is, I'm gonna start with the absolute least favorite uh, uh, method of making coffee. And I'm gonna tell you why this is, okay? Now I don't have one of these uh, uh, implements and I, I probably will never have one. I'm talking about a percolator. This is what they used back in the old days. You, you, you throw coffee into a hopper basically that's got some, you know, a perforated bottom on it so coffee can flow through, right? You put your dry coffee in there and you set it on top of a tube that goes down to the bottom of a pot. And when the water starts heating in this, you plug it in, it starts getting hotter and hotter. The, the hot water is gonna move up the spout and it's gonna start spilling over into your grounds above and delicious coffee will rain down above. But where it's going, it's going straight back into the water in the bottom, which remember is boiling. And boiling's a no-no for your coffee, right? And now that it's boiling, you've got this hot coffee going up a tube instead of hot water. And now hot coffee is showering over these grounds. And now we are just putting boiling coffee over these wet grounds and we start developing tannins as fast as you can imagine, right? It's just gonna be a very, very nasty pot. Even the best percolated coffee is nasty. Okay. And most of the time people will leave that plugged in. They forget that it's boiling and it'll just keep showering bitter coffee over your grounds, becoming more and more bitter as time goes on. Right. It's just the most horrible way you could possibly make coffee. Uh, and, and again, it's going to be held uh, with a heating element. So it's just going to degrade really, really fast. You're going to make a bad pot of coffee. That's going to get even worse over time. Right. So Percolation is your is not your friend. Okay, this is a method that in, that that includes a complete and utter disdain for that bean and that little bean. Every single one of those little beans, they had hopes and dreams and aspirations to make a good cup of coffee, and you're just not letting it happen if you use a percolator. So friends, don't let friends percolate coffee. Okay, if you learn nothing else today, take that home with you. All right. Uh, next method is what I call the drip or, you know, what they called it in the old days was the Melita method. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Coffee was a drip coffee maker. Melita brands that have the famous cone, the paper cones and things like that. Uh, that is a drip method. Okay. This is a, a pretty great method, especially if you're kind of doing it by hand that you see in the, uh, the coffee bars nowadays, right? Uh, when we're doing this, this style of coffee making, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. The, the coffee is in a basket above an empty pot. And you are going to go ahead and use a medium grind for this one. Your, that filter usually will kind of let sediment through. So you want a, a pretty medium grind. You don't want it too fine. Okay. Uh, you're going to give it a little touch of water on top to bloom the grounds. This is going to, again, release some of those essences and uh, the oils and allow you to extract better flavor out of it much quicker, much more efficiently. Okay. Um, once you bloom those grounds for say a minute or so, you can go ahead and let it rip with the water. And then once all the water goes through it in the correct ratio, your golden ratio or what have you, uh, you're going to go ahead and uh, remove that filter. Very, very important that you do not leave the filter hanging out above that, that coffee. It's just going to kind of steam underneath and you're just going to get tannins dripping into your coffee, making a very, very bitter brew. Okay. Um, so I should mention that most of your, uh, uh, drip coffee makers that you have. I got one over here, you know, uh, one, one, those drip coffee makers, some of them will actually have kind of an automatic blooming function where it'll just kind of wet the grounds. It'll stop for a bit and then it'll start up again. Okay. So you might kind of hear your machine kind of going on and off and, and things like that. So, uh, interesting stuff that, and I think it's pretty cool that some of the machines actually think about the blooming process in there. Okay. Uh, once your coffee goes through the system, you just enjoy, add your, add your sweet, your cream, whatever you do. And, uh, and, and that's it. Okay. So drip, drip coffee, pretty straightforward. And I think that's the coffee that most of us in America are, are kind of used to these days. Okay. Uh, let's talk about French press. I brought one of those along. Uh, here's a little French press. Okay. Now this French press, uh, has a little plunger in there that is a very, very fine screen. But again, it's not as fine as say a paper filter or something like that. And so for this one, we're gonna want uh, something along the lines of a medium grind for your French press. Uh, you put your coffee straight into the pot uh, and then you go ahead and pour in a tiny bit of water again to bloom the grounds, wait for a minute, and then go ahead and fill it up with the proper amount of water using the golden ratio, okay? And then after a time, you're gonna go ahead and put your plunger on there put the lid down and then just give it a shove. You don't want to jam it down, okay? Uh, uh, you're just going to just slowly press it down so you're not forcing grounds out around the edges or, or, or things like that, right? Uh, and then 
once you do, uh, your coffee is done. I should say that um, once you add your water in there, uh, let it sit for about three minutes before you press it down. I, I left that little step out, okay? So uh, it's medium grind, bloom your grounds, add the rest of the water after a minute and let that stand for three minutes and then add the plunger and let her rip, okay? And that is your French press coffee. Fine restaurants uh, uh, will offer French presses for the table so you can spend a little bit extra and they'll sell you a pot of French roast and uh, I'm sorry, a French press, bring it right to your table and then you can serve yourself for it. It's interactive coffee service and people love interactive food, interactive beverages, desserts, things like that. It gives you something to do at the table, okay? So uh, that's the French press. I think every most everybody's pretty familiar with those two, but again, don't forget to bloom, okay? That's a big thing with those, all right? Let's see. The next one is cold brew. I'm just gonna kind of talk about this one. It's not one I've played with. I, I kind of played with it once, okay? Um, the, the cold brew, we for that one, we want a medium grind again. Um, we are looking for cold water in this. And the idea is we're not heating the water. We're just letting it sit for about 18 hours or 20 hours, right? And we can actually let it sit in the refrigerator and it's just gonna kind of go slow and you almost extract flavor out of it. It is a very vibrant, fresh flavor because we're not adding heat to the process. You're not getting those tannins. So it's a, it's a smooth cup of coffee. Let's call it smooth yet bold, okay? And then you uh, go ahead and decant it, that cold brew is gonna have a little bit of sediment in the bottom and everything. So I like to kind of decant it, which, which basically means we're slowly pouring it into another uh, item or container. I like to do that step. And then I leave most of the mud back in my original container. And then I've got a fairly uh, clean and delicious cold brewed coffee uh, in, my, in my other hand there, okay? So um, that's kind of a cool method. You're seeing more and more about that as we go. I'm kind of looking at the comments here. Uh, just got a couple people out there. We're doing great. And this is a pretty quick class. Um, we're getting there, we're getting there. So uh, the next one I wanna talk about is, is, I think a lot of you have seen implements that'll make this coffee, but you don't hear the term very much, okay? Double strength coffee. These use special coffee makers and here's one of them. I've got kind of a cool old one that I got at a garage sale, okay? Um, the water goes in this side of it here. And when that heats up, it's going to send steam and pressurized water up into a basket. Let me get rid of this. Uh, up into a basket that's full of coffee. And you can see that's perforated, right? And uh, this thing holds a lot of coffee and it makes a really strong cup of coffee. Um, it just gives you a tiny, tiny pitcher. And you might've seen coffee makers that look like this, but there's another container on the bottom of it, right? Uh, I can't remember the name of, of those guys, uh, not Chemex, something else. Um, Chemex is the glass one that you use the paper filters on. So anyway, you see these a lot and people call them espresso makers, but these are, these are actually double strength coffee makers. And they make a really, really, strong cup of mud, okay? This little pitcher right here will keep me up for two days if I drank it, drank it okay? It's it's just rocket fuel coming out of these things. Uh, you want a very, very fine grind. This is just like making an espresso. You fill that hopper up, uh, you, you let it do its thing. It's gonna kick the water through here, through this little hopper and into the pitcher. And then once it's done, you just turn it off. This doesn't have a switch on it or anything. It's a very simple mechanism. I just unplug this thing and my coffee's done. And uh, that is my double strength coffee maker. Again, for these guys, you want a real fine grind for these guys. And also, again, they look like this with another little container that looks like almost an upside down pitcher on the bottom, okay? And those go just right on your stove top. And you see those all over the place. And the beatniks all drink coffee like that, right? Okay. Uh, Bialetti, Johnny just shouted out the name for those. A Bialetti is that double container. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Johnny. All right, so that's my double strength coffee uh, uh, maker, okay? Uh, another one, I'm just gonna mention, just real quick, Turkish coffee. If you've ever experienced this, it's a very different cup of brew. It really, really is. Um, now we make Turkish coffee in a tiny little pitcher, usually made of brass, okay, or copper uh, brass. And it's got a handle coming out the side. They're called an ibrik, okay? Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I pronounce, mispronounce everything. But for the Turkish coffee, that's where we use the extra fine grind, even finer than espresso grind, right? And these super fine grinds just go straight into the water, into our little ibrik. And I like to throw in a little crushed cardamom pot as well, just to kind of get a little funky. I don't know if you can hear it. I've got 
construction going on in the background here. I don't know how this is working for you guys, but uh, I have a little crushed cardamom in there, optional, okay? And then I bring my little Ebrick to a boil and we'll actually boil that coffee quite a bit. It gets a little bit bitter. And then we slowly pour it into a cup, very small cup, and we add an ass ton of sugar to be quite honestly, we make this stuff sweeter than heck, right? It's, it's almost syrupy when you drink this. And then you just enjoy, okay? Um, you, you're going to get a lot of grounds in this. And if it bugs you, I'm sorry, because the grounds in this are, are a part of the experience. You're going to have a pretty muddy cup of coffee with that Turkish coffee, okay? Very, very strong small amounts of this stuff. You got to be careful with it or, or else again, you'll, you'll just be up for two days. Okay. Uh, uh, so Turkish coffee, it's quite an experience. If you ever get a, a chance to try it, you should at least experience it uh, one time. Okay. In your lifetime. And so uh, that ran through a bunch of different uh, uh, coffee making machines. I want to kind of get into making an espresso for you guys and talk about some barista stuff. Now I'm not, I, I'm not one that I, I don't, I don't make the fancy, Designs on top, but I just want to kind of talk about the basic, basic stuff of making uh, the basic techniques behind making an espresso. Uh, okay, so um, basically, we are looking at a fine grind when we're doing espresso, and uh, once we do that, we need to fill the little hopper. And I've got a little hopper here for my espresso. That's what I'm going to call this guy. And these little cups in here, you might have seen those guys. They come out of the handle very, very easily. And some of them are smaller than this. This is a double shot uh, um, uh, die here. And then they also have single shots would kind of have a ridge in there. They don't hold as much coffee, okay? So you go ahead and measure your coffee into that, place it into your handle, and then that is going to go onto your machine, okay? Why don't I go ahead and start grinding coffee? Let's get into that and uh, start making this now, okay? I've got my machine on, it's heating up some water and uh, we're gonna have some espresso going in just a sec. I'm starting to hear the hissing over here. Yeah, it's working, it's working. Okay, so I've got a grinder here, okay? It's got whole beans in it. I don't have an espresso roast. It's actually kind of a mix. I've got some espresso beans in there, but then I've got some other ones that are a little bit lighter. I needed to kind of stretch it out for our demo today. My apologies. But usually your espresso roast is gonna be very, very dark. And again, very, very shiny. The oil has moved out to the surface when they get that dark roast and it makes it quite shiny. So I'm gonna go ahead and grind this. Uh, it's a pretty common grinder here. Now, when you're doing your grinding, one of the things that I learned is we don't want to heat it up in here. I want to heat the coffee up in the pot. So I don't want to sit here with the button down the whole time, zzz, zzz, building up friction in there. I want to pulse this thing so I can um, really get a uh, better uh, flavor out of this coffee. Let me just flick a switch here. And we'll get back to that. So plugging it in, and grinding our coffee, okay? I'm gonna pulse this, that's the lesson. I give it a little shake now and then. Right now, it's at about medium. I don't know, I, I don't even wanna take the lid off. Coffee's gonna go everywhere. But it's about medium grind right now. Sometimes I'll turn it upside down where it really spins out and it's getting pretty darn fine. It doesn't take long. Again, pulse this so we don't build up friction in here that's gonna cause us to lose flavor, okay? Now I'm gonna flip it over and get my coffee out of there. And I'm just gonna dump it in a container that I can use for my espresso. So there it is, it smells delicious, okay? I just love the smell of coffee. There's nothing like it. And I'm just gonna put it in a little container here, a little deli cup like we always use around here. And there it is, okay? I've got a nice fine espresso grind coffee there. It's not quite as dark as I like. Let me get rid of this uh, grinder here. I have two of these, by the way. I have one for spices and one for coffee. I don't go back and forth with that because everything would taste like coffee no matter how well I clean this out. There's a trick, you can put a little rice in there and spin it uh, to get rid of the uh, flavors or whatever is in there. But um, yeah, I, I, I prefer to keep separate ones. All right, so that is grinding. Big lesson there was pulse, pulse. Don't build up friction. Next, I am going to go ahead and begin measuring my coffee. So I uh, have my double pull here and I'm gonna go ahead and fill it. I've got two implements here. One of them is a scoop and the other one 
is a tamper and you're gonna need a tamper. This one's broken, I lost the top of it, but you've probably seen these in uh, you know, your coffee houses. They're actually attached to the coffee grinder. So you can kind of take a couple of pre-measured poles on the coffee grinder to put coffee into your dye. And then there's this, one of these is mounted there and you just press this up against it and you're in business, okay? We need to smooth, pack the coffee in and kind of smooth it out. One thing here though, is we don't wanna overfill this because if we put too much coffee in here, it's not gonna fit on my machine, okay? So let me go ahead and get some coffee in there. I'm gonna put in two scoops and see if that's the right measure. Maybe a scoop and a half. And there it is, okay? Go down there. And then I'm gonna get my tamper, very important. now. My tamper, I might have a little too much coffee in there. My tamper is rounded on top and I need a flat surface here. So when I do my tamper, I will set it on there and I actually kind of turn it. You guys see what I'm doing there? To try and get the edges smashed down. So when I pull the tamper off, I've got a flat top, okay? So this rounded one is not my favorite thing, but it's the only one I've ever had. I gotta go, it's time to buy a new one, okay? Let's see. If you have time, please uh, cover the way to best clean the inside of a stainless carafe. Absolutely. Uh, let's just do that right now, and then I'll get back into the coffee because I'm in between things. I've got my, my loaded uh, coffee pole right there. So let me set that aside. I'm going to pull my machine over, and let's talk about that. Now, with a carafe, typically um, we're using a... Uh, Let's, let's go back actually. Now, sometimes you wanna think about um, using a filtered water because uh, you can get, if you have high mineral content, if you have a really high water, uh, I'm sorry, hard water, you're gonna wanna use a filtered water because you get tons and tons of mineral buildup in your coffee maker. You get tons of funk in your coffee uh, uh, pot and, and everything else that the coffee comes in contact with. So you wanna use a filtered water and you'll get less of that buildup. Now, as far as your carafes and things like that, um, they make products like Limeways and things like that that you can put in there and, and, and out in the industry, they would give us chemicals specifically made for running through the machinery to break down mineral deposits, to get rid of funky old coffee tannins that have built up in there and everything. Uh, but if you don't have anything like that, we typically use a little solution of baking soda. Just, I usually, I don't measure it or anything. I just get like a, uh, uh, I get my pitcher full of water and I will actually run it through my coffee maker. Uh, I will put some uh, uh, baking soda in there, pour it into my coffee machine, let that run through. Uh, I've experimented with vinegar as well. It's not quite as effective. I, I tend to go with the the um, baking soda thing. I will be honest for you. Uh, let's see, that was Ann that asked that question. Honestly, uh, most of my experience has been with like the professional chemical stuffs because most of my uh, work has been out in the industry with, with this stuff, okay? So um, I tend to use those. There's a lot of products on the market, but again, baking soda does a pretty darn good job for clearing out your, your carafes and things like that. So um, there is that. I hope, I hope that helped, okay? Let me go ahead and grab my espresso machine and bring it over and you can bask in its glory. It's a beautiful machine. This is a Wapavoni, if anyone's familiar with it. Would you just look at that? Let me plug her back in. And there it is, okay? It looks like a kind of a cool old fashioned machine. And much like my double, double strength coffee maker, this guy has a water tank on it. You fill this up with filtered water. I use filtered water today. And there's just a few switches. Let me turn her around. Just a few switches here. It's basically got a low setting and a high setting. And then it's also got an on off switch is the red one. Okay. So it's currently on and I've got it set for low and that's just kind of on standby. You can hear the steam escaping. It has a little escape valve right there for steam. This guy is piping hot right now. Uh, it also has a uh, steam jet on here as well. And as we use a steam jet, it's been building up pressure in here and water's kind of water and steam are built up through the entire thing. There is water that is condensed down in the steam jet. Before I use it, you're going to see me shoot the water out of this thing. You've probably seen them do that at the uh, 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 coffee houses. And then I'm going to go ahead and steam my milk. And I'll be steaming my milk before I get into the actual espresso. Okay. My espresso is just kind of sitting off to the side right now in its uh, little handle. I'll show it to you again. There it is. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It all goes together. I love it. Uh, let me go ahead and grab some milk for this and we'll talk about that. So ideally, when we are steaming milk, we want our milk 
to be ice cold. It tends to work better. It's very, very hard to get foam out of milk that's already hot. As I work with this milk, I've picked something, usually you see a metal container, but I picked something that you can kind of see the advancement of the foam up through it, okay? So you'll see this uh, liquid almost double in size, okay? And so that'll be kind of, uh, you'll see me steam milk here. As we're steaming milk, the trick with this is to first, I suggest holding the bottom of this. I don't wanna heat up the milk here. The idea at first is just to steam or foam the milk, get the foam on top here. And to do that, I want the tip of my jet to be right underneath the surface of the milk. And it's going to be kind of, the steam is gonna be shooting across the surface of that milk. And it, the activity of that, the agitation there is what's going to foam that milk, okay? And so if you dive way down deep with that jet down into the bottom of this thing, remember I'm, holding from the bottom. If I have the jet in the bottom, what it's gonna do is heat the milk. There's gonna be no surface agitation. We're really not gonna get any foam out of this. So again, we wanna do all the foaming first. Then what you're gonna see me do, once I get the foam, you're gonna see me jam the jet down in the bottom. I'll lift this up so the jet's way down there and I'm gonna move it up and down. And that's what's gonna heat my milk for my cappuccino. I'm gonna make a cappuccino. And so that is what we're gonna see next, okay? Let me just move a few other things over here and just, to kind of bloom my grounds, I'm actually going to attach them to the machine. So they're locked in there, that's a double shot. And then let's go ahead and steam milk, okay? This is gonna be fun. Now before I steam milk, I have water down in this tube, I mentioned it, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up the jet and shoot out that water. Get rid of that nasty water down there. And not much was in there. <clears throat> and now we're going to go ahead and start steaming the milk. Again, you're going to see the, um, the jet just at the surface. I'm holding the bottom so I can feel this milk. If it starts getting too hot, I can kind of ease up on the stick. Okay. So here we go. Put the jet in and crank it on. I'm opening the valve all the way. You can see the foam. As I'm doing this, you can see sometimes a, a, a V-shaped jet of steam coming out. I've got big bubbles and I've got fine bubbles in there. I'm still at the surface and you can see the bubbles being created. As the big bubbles are created, I'm also creating small ones below. Okay, The tip is just at the top of the milk. The milk's getting a little bit warm, and I think I've got all the foam I'm gonna get out of this one. So now I'm gonna shove that jet down to the bottom, and now I'm heating milk. I'm not foaming milk right now. The foaming is done. And because I'm holding the bottom, I can feel how hot that milk is getting. That's a thing. Nice. Stir it around. Still not quite as hot as I want. And I think we're there. Turn that off. And while that's still wet, I wanna grab a towel and wipe that off. If you let that milk sit on there, it's gonna cook to that jet. So go ahead and wipe it off and we're gonna clean that even better later. And now I have steamed milk. One of the things with this milk, I've got a bunch of big bubbles. I want the full, fine bubbles. So I tend to tap it very gently a few times. Now I wanna make my espresso. My milk is ready. I've got a coffee cup ready to go here and I've got a small pitcher. I'm just gonna use a cup measure so you can see this. And I'm gonna start making my espresso now. I'm gonna, to make the espresso, I'm gonna kick this up to the second speed here. And so we're going on to high. And let me just wait until we start hearing this, um, uh, uh, sh start shooting steam out of the vent here. I'm gonna get a cup of uh, a little sip of water while we do this. I'm starting to hear the pressure building up again. This is, a, this is not a user-friendly machine. This is a machine for someone who likes to get their hands involved in, in whatever it is that they're doing. I've got a cup here, I've got steamed milk. I've got a, a pitcher, let me go grab one more thing, two more things, a little garnish for the top. 
And we're almost there. Come on, baby. It's working. This pressure release valve, it's gonna start singing. There it goes. Now what's going on is I've got this pressurized water and steam inside the water tank back here. This side capsule right here is a chamber for a pre-measured amount of steam. When I lift this handle up, it's gonna open a valve here, let the steam into that capsule, and then that, I'm gonna press that pre-measured amount of liquid down through the coffee grounds, okay? But, so here we go with the first pull, and let it stand, the coffee's starting to come out. And then I'm just gonna gently push it down, I'm not cranking it through. A good cup of espresso is gonna have a little of that foam on top. We call that foam crema and it holds the essence of the coffee. And now I'm just gonna give it one more pull because this is a double shot. Starting to get a little more crema out of it. It's just a tiny bit there. It's meh, it's all right. And then once you've got that, I'm just gonna shut it off. We're done making this cup. And I wanna let it sit here for a minute because it's still kicking out little drips of uh, coffee, okay? Now I don't wanna pull this off immediately because there is still pressure built up uh, uh, underneath this, within this handle here. So if I pull this off really quickly, coffee grounds will shoot out of there all over and kind of cut across your top, whatever you're wearing, right? So uh, we're just gonna leave that handle on there and let it chill for a little bit until steam dissipates out of that, that area. And I'm gonna go ahead and make my, uh, make a cappuccino here, okay? Very, very basic. I got a little coffee ground in there. Let me get that. And for this one, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, grab a spoon and I've got my steamed milk and I'm holding the foam back and I'm just putting in milk. There it is. And then I've got my foamed milk in there. That's gonna set aside. I'm gonna pour in my coffee. When we make lattes, we do this very slowly so we get a layered effect in them. And this cup's almost big enough. This is like a, a 12 ounce cup almost. It's kind of it's uh, it's deceiving how big that is. A little bit of crema in there. So there it is. And then I'm going to go ahead and spoon my foam on top. Now I'm leaving that liquid milk behind and look at the foam, it's just chunky foam. I love it. Ah, uh, we're looking at just a regular old cappuccino here. By the way, a latte is just gonna be like double the milk. And there it is, nice. Remember I knocked the big bubbles of foam out. So this is a very fine foam. Look at that. I love that, how it mounds. I love it when it mounds up, okay? Next, I'm just gonna give it the tiniest little pinch. My garnish for the top is, uh, this is kind of old school. It's gonna be a pinch of cinnamon and a pinch of nutmeg. This is a, a, a combination we call Vaucare. There's a cocktail with the same name. When I put cinnamon and nutmeg together, we call it Vaucare. Very common in chocolatey drinks as well, but it's nice on an espresso. A little fresh ground nutmeg, It's enough. And there's a beautiful little cappuccino, okay? And that's really all I wanted to do with that, okay? So again, with the espresso, I used a fine grind there. I put it in the hopper, I filled the hopper, and then I did, a, you know, whether it's a single or a double, I did a couple of pools on that. Uh, and then I'm gonna say, pick up, I got a coffee over here in the window. See if anybody comes to get that, okay? Uh, let's see, that's all. Uh, so uh, I either do one or two pulls, I force it on through, I look for the elusive crema, okay? That, that little foam that goes on the top, it's just the essence of goodness on that. And then once it's done, you can enjoy. And my trophy wife is doing so right now, okay? And so there she goes. All right, so um, with the steam milk, again, uh, we use uh, uh, cold milk, okay? One thing I didn't talk about is the type of milk we use, actually. Uh, uh, usually we want either a whole milk or what you'll see in the barista joints are, is a extra rich milk. And what that is is a whole milk and it's got extra milk solids. It's like they put uh, powdered milk in there, basically. So it's just extra protein. Think of egg whites, how they hold air in a meringue. It's the same idea. I've got that extra protein in the milk and it'll hold air much better, okay? 
Okay, and so uh, we use an extra milk, uh, I'm sorry, an extra rich milk in the, uh, in, when we're steaming milk. You don't typically see that in a grocery store though. It's usually like straight from the dairy uh, to a uh, barista or something like that. Um, now going through, I mentioned cold milk steams better. I like to, I, I recommend holding the bottom of the pitcher uh, and then the tip of the jet just goes right under the surface of the milk. I wanna see kind of a V-shaped spread of steam shooting out of there. And that is what's gonna aerate that, that milk. Uh, uh, the milk proteins are gonna hold air and you're just gonna get a beautiful foam. Uh, once I get the foam built up, I push the cup up so the jet goes down to the bottom, maybe move it up and down slightly. <gasps> <clears throat> excuse me, and that is going to heat up your milk as you go. It, it's, it's much more efficient if you're kind of moving it around in there, okay? Uh, create the form, you're creating foam, and then warming the rest of the milk that way. Uh, when you pour it in, you're holding back the foam, pour a little milk in there, add your shot or shots, and then you top it with foam, and then you saw me add a little garnish on top, right? And if you want to get into it, you can get into the, the uh, espresso painting on the top and things like that. It's really mind-blowing what some of the guys do these days with that, okay? And that's a, that's a cappuccino. As I said, add a little more milk, and you've got yourself a latte, okay? Add chocolate to the milk, and you'll have a chocolate cappuccino or a chocolate latte or what we might call a mocha, okay? And, and, and that's basically it, okay? I kind of gave my espresso away before I tasted it. How's that espresso, honey? It's very good, okay? From straight from the, the, the beautiful wife's mouth, okay? So um, let's see, I, it sounds like that's a fine cup of java, okay? And so that kind of brings me to what I, the end of what I wanted to cover in this edition of Industry Cooking, where I am laying down my classic culinary school lectures until I get a job like an actual grown-up man, okay? Until then, I'll be running this very sad, pretend cooking show live every Monday at 4 p.m. in the Industry Cooking Community Group. <clears throat> on Facebook, okay? Don't forget to go over to the archives. I've got a ton, a ton of these industry cooking videos on YouTube that are just right there, okay? So roll over, subscribe right now. And while you're at it, subscribe your mom up too over there. And uh, it'll make you feel a lot better, okay? For now, I am Dave Nelson. I'm gonna be back next week with some more ripping kitchen wisdom for you. Till then, keep cooking because as everybody knows, the party is always, always in the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, class is, wait for it, dismissed. <laughs>